absolutely stunning performance from you, Sandra. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Honored to be Me here. too. To speak with you about this incredible, incredible film. So far, this film has won <laughs> the Palm d'Or at Cannes, Best Screenplay at the Gotham Awards, Best International Feature at the Gotham Awards, and Best International Feature by the New York Critics Circle. Wow. Very, very, very well said. So let's get into it, right? I, I think I want to start this by asking you all a question. And with a show of hands, I would like to know who thinks she did it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Who thinks she didn't do it? <laughs> okay. No, she didn't do it. <sighs> it was good though, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You want me to, 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 should I say what I think? Yeah, you what, know what? Would we discuss? Please. You know what? Yeah, that was going to be my last question, but yes. <laughs> let's get start. I, let's you know, start there. When we, when, when I, when I read the script, I didn't have this question because I was on her side immediately because she was struggling so hard and I felt for her, and I admired the way that she's going through this with a calmness that is so. Yeah, to me, it was very um, magnificent enough, but uh, I liked it a lot. That's very simple. Um, I admired it, and um, then shortly before we started shooting, I felt like, wait a minute, maybe I'm completely on the right path because we never talked about it and uh, Justine didn't seem interested in this question and uh, so I asked her and she said she cannot answer it she won't answer it and I should play her as if she was an innocent and it totally freaked me out um, because then I didn't know and yeah it was even worse and then I felt that the the what I felt in the beginning was probably the more important thing to to, to be empathetic with her, to feel with her, to, um, yeah, and also to raise the question in the audience that was, that was there all the time, uh, to be, to, to create something that would reflect on the audience and back to the screen, so it would be a dialogue between everybody about how we feel about people and why, and what does draw us to them and what pushes us away from them, what information makes them sympathetic and what information we get about them makes us, you know. So all these things were more interesting than, to me than the question if she did it. Mm. So what, what did you think when you first received the script? I mean, what, what really drew you into the project and said, no, I need to play this woman? It's really rare to have such a character uh, that is so rich um, that is so modern also. I never saw somebody have, fight in that way, to have such good arguments, uh, to be so reflected and so clear, and uh, to stand up for oneself. That's, that, that was so interesting to me, and I think I've never read anything like this, but maybe Ines and Tony Eggman is a bit of the same. She also says, that's my life, and I don't want to change it. If you want to change it, it's kind of your problem, but not mine. And that is something that I cannot do so well, so I thought maybe I can practice a little bit. That's, yeah. You know, I think it's really interesting because you've said in, in previous interviews that you don't really have a, a process or a method, right? But I know that many of us in this room are probably performers, and myself as a performer. Um, and I know that's me sort of paraphrasing, but you more so like to leave things to chance, but girl, What's tea? <laughs> Give us some insight because I'm really, I'm, I'm dying to know more about your process. I mean, this character is such a puzzle. How did you create that puzzle? Well, it really happens on set. I really have to say it. The work with Justine is such a collecting, collective, collecting, collaboration process, digging, uh, capturing moments, going wrong. Um, there were scenes that we shot twice on another day because we felt like it, it was kind of wrong. And we had an idea three days later that, that, we, 
that made us that made it important to change it. Um, yeah, so it was a kind of a very very rich and moving and moved process. So the preparation was mostly the language. I had to learn French again. I, I learned it in school, and I I love the language, so I learned it privately too. But then, uh, yeah, so I tried to improve that and try to find my way through all these little movements in the script because it's so perfectly written that you can just follow this path. And I didn't want to follow it completely blind, which sometimes is a good idea to just go there and not know anything about anybody. But in this case, I had to find out about the relationship with the sun and all these things. So, but the mo most of the work, I have to say, really happened on set. Yeah. That's incredible to be able to go back and, and reshoot something. And I'm guessing this is after discussion with Justine or like you guys will be shooting something else and you have an idea. I mean, that's incredible, which I think very much differs from the way a lot of American productions that I've done have, have gone. Do you find that there is somewhat of a difference or, or I don't know, maybe you just had an, an insane budget on this. <laughs> Do you find that there is, um, I mean, I, I feel like it's sort of a basic question, but what do you find about navigating sort of American productions versus European productions? Versus, I mean, you've worked with directors from so many different countries, and do you find that there are, you know, these distinct differences of how the machine sort of works, or how you're valued as a performer, or what space you're given to create? Or I so wish I could answer that, but I have no idea. <laughs> I really, I've never been in an American production. I really don't know how this works. No, never. So I, I really, I only hear rumors sometimes. <laughs> it's a bit different. But um, in this case, I mean, Justine had incredible producers, uh, Mario Luciani and uh, David Thion, who, I don't know, they believed so much in the film and she said she had to shoot something again. And she didn't say because you woke up in the morning and think, oh, I think I have to shoot something again. She really, you know, it was really important. So they, yeah, they let her do it and found the money somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it shows that she was very supported by her producers. Yes, yes she Because was. I know that I've definitely worked with you know both male and female filmmakers, and you can feel and sense the difference when a female filmmaker is supported by her producers in that way and not argued with when she wants to do something different. Now, you first worked with Justine in, uh, on 2019 Sybil. Mm -hmm. So what can you speak to the, the creative evolution between the two of you from that project to this one, you know, how did that process differ from this experience, in addition to the fact that obviously you're starring and carrying this film? I feel like between these films, Justine somehow, I don't know, she learned to, to, to trust herself more in her instincts. Um, and she didn't have so much fights with people around to, to to get what she wants. I think this time she kind of, she, she went into it from another level. I can't explain it differently. And also she, when you see her first films, they, they look very chaotic. They aren't, they are just documentary. She's using a lot of sort of, it looks like documentary scenes and documentary material, but it's all uh, staged. <coughs> I don't know how she does it, but that's kind of her craft. And then she did two films who were a bit more polished. They were more like, more, I don't know, more chic maybe also. And um, I think with this one, she kind of wanted to go back or like forget about certain things that, that were too complicated to look after all the time because she really wanted to find out something and to show something about searching for the truth. And, um, so she was very happy that we didn't take so much makeup time and that, you know, uh, sometimes the DOP wasn't ready with the light and she wanted to start shooting anyway and she didn't, you know, all these things. So she, she kind of embraced the, the messiness of it and uh, her, um, her editing uh, partner, what's the name, please help me, the wonderful editor. Um, whom she spent a lot of time with, like put all this together in the end, because it was a lot of material, of course. Um, something that I only just very recently discovered is that uh, Justine and her co-writer, 
Arthur, Arthur Harari are both creative partners and romantic partners. So what was it like to navigate that within their working relationship and what did that sort of add to the experience? I mean, it sounds spicy. <laughs> oh, that, that's something that they have to talk about and they, they do it in a very fun way, I have to say. We did some Q and A's together, so. Uh, I think they're stable, so um, yeah, it's okay. Um, uh, Arthur wasn't on set; uh, he didn't join us for shooting. They have two kids, so he's. They, they I think they switch who's working. Um, I think for them, that's what they say in Q and A's. It was, uh, of course, it was sort of difficult to write, it, and they also say they did it last time uh, together. Um, writing a script. Uh, they started just before the first lockdown and Justine just asked him to help him a little bit and then uh, yeah, they got stuck uh, with this story and had to work it all out. It took two or three years um, and they sometimes say that in the end they were just writing emails from one room to another. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think they were very very precise with everything and they kind of wrote down their worst nightmare of what could happen to them. So there are two scenes that I really want to make sure that we talk about. I mean, first of all, again, I have to say, it's such phenomenal work. And it was, I mean, I was literally watching it with uh, paper and pen, I mean, for this, but also just as an actor, um, because there was so much to learn. I mean, I found it gripping and poignant and something that I felt that it truly highlighted, especially just the whole court trial element of it all was misogyny. Um, can you talk about, you know, this tension between men and women in relationship, between career and ambition and who leads and who follows and, you know, what where you kind of felt like you started in that story and you know your entry point into that and, and sort of what was inspiring you in that or what you just have to say about that like what are your <coughs> thoughts girl <laughs> yeah i really can't share my private situation here but um, <laughs> um i think it's relatable for a lot of people uh, for a lot of reasons, and I think Atu and Justine decided to start with this question of time and how we share it in this argument scene, the, the central argument of the film, because it's something that everybody has. Um, I think uh, everybody around me has this issue in their relationship, and of course it's always a question of power and a question of how aware you are of this sort of dynamic. and. Uh, how you take care of it, how good you can repair, because we always hurt people, it's like you can't avoid it, but how much work you put into re rebuilding the trust, talking the things through, and all these these things. Um, so, yeah, what can I say? For me, this is a really modern piece. I don't think I've ever seen a relationship in a film so precisely shown. It's like something that really hits, as we say in German, a nagel auf den Kopf. Um, like it's like really on the on the point, yeah, on the spot. Yeah, it's yeah. a nail on the head. No, so, yeah. yeah, probably everybody here can yeah. tell a personal story or can relate to what they see here. Even the that this is a toxic relationship. Um, we have these words for it now. For earlier, we would have said it's a bit difficult. <laughs> and it would have been not enough to say, but we wouldn't find the words for that. And now we have sort of labels for it, and we know that we should leave. Um, and it's still hard to do this step. And I, I, I definitely don't know how this couple would have continued after this, this fight. Because also when we shot the scene, there was a moment where we felt, because we shot it on two days, and there was this, we didn't ever pass a certain level of energy because we felt when we pass this point, we can't go back to the beginning. Because there is a line that once you cross it, you can't look each other in the eye like before. Um, yeah, that was a long answer, yeah. No, that was an incredible answer, and it's so true, I mean, 
there's so many elements of it that felt triggering just because I think any ambitious or successful woman has had some version of that conversation with a partner or a husband, um, especially when it came to what uh, Samuel was saying about Daniel and how he would bring Daniel into the conversation. So I think that's also something very interesting to explore. You know, we were having a conversation outside and talking about just in, you know, we were trying to talk about like, do we think that she did it or not? And, and, and one person said, well, the fact that she didn't want to go home immediately to her son is an indication that she did it. Um, but then I think there's also something to be said for the fact that so much was revealed in that courtroom to this child that would make it so hard to face him. What were your, what was your thinking or your thoughts and like in that decision, what was your, you know, justification for, for that? Other than it just being something that's written that, okay, she goes to a, to a, a bar and, and has dinner. I, I had that judgment too. I also felt like I would go home immediately, of course. But I, I can't imagine myself in such a situation, so I can't say what I would do. It's ridiculous. I can't, I can't imagine. Um, but I felt that, yeah, their, their, their relationship has changed completely. Um, and also I think maybe the boy even has more power now than she has in the house because, yeah, there was a shift and she knows about this shift and nobody knows if he invented the story. Uh, that doesn't mean she's guilty, but it still means he would have lied to save her. So it's like if all these things are in the air and how hard would it be to talk about this and to find out how they can start to live together again. What if he would ask the question one day, what is the truth really? Because they didn't find out in court. They just made a decision. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a difficult situation and I think it's kind of relatable that somebody tries to hide from it like a child. I'm not here, so. There are so many moments, it's, you know, when you just said they didn't uh, find out what happened, they just made a decision. There's so many moments in the film that sort of point to or really outright say what the main ethos of the film is. You know, there is that scene where the minder is speaking to Daniel and, you know, he's saying to her, help me to understand what, what, you know, did she do it or not? And she said, you know, later on, after she's gone and thought about it, she says, you know, you just have to decide what you believe. You know, and and so it's like then- A monstrous you sentence, isn't it? <sighs> It's so monstrous to, because that's what we do all the time. We do nothing else than to decide what we believe. And what, what kind of little things make us believe this is right and this is right, and to put that on the channel. Yeah, but he, yeah, he, he did what she said, so. Yeah, and you, so you have to wonder, was he just deciding that she was innocent and thus fabricating a story, or sincerely did that happen and he was, finally putting it all together and we'll never know. I love how this film forces you to live in the question. One of my favorite uh, quotes by one of my favorite authors, Anna Yislin, is that love never dies a natural death, it dies because we don't know how to replenish its source. It dies of blindness and errors and betrayals. It dies of illness and wounds. It dies of weariness, of witherings, of tarnishings, which really feels like the story of this couple and also ominously feels like, you know, what threat, what could threaten to happen between this mother and her son eventually because there's so much, we don't know exactly where the betrayals are. I mean, this is not a question. So <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just talking at this point. Not yet. <laughs> um, we don't really know where, where the, the, the betrayals are and, and if there is a betrayal. You know, when, when he says to her, I was afraid for you to come home and she says, I was also scared to come home. But I think there was something really beautiful in that embrace that they share at the end, you know, that choice to move on. But I do, you know, I would love to hear your thoughts, you know, just on what this film is saying about motherhood. Because there are many points in the story, there's never an indication really of the type of mother you, that you are in the film because we don't really see you doing too much of it except for these moments here and there that occur after your husband has died. But during that fight, the fight, he sort of brings up that you're not doing enough. 
do you feel that that is true, was true of your character, or do you feel that that more is about his own dissatisfaction with him being able to do what he needed to do? Which I feel like is all he, he knows that it's, it's a dangerous thing to say, and he knows that's triggering for her, that's for sure, at that point. He does it to provoke. I don't know if he thinks it's true. But I cannot talk about motherhood in general because there is no such thing. It's just not there. There is, a, there is like a million, a trillion, whatever mothers on the and everybody does it differently. And um, they're probably all right. I mean, there are boundaries that, and there are lines that we should not cross. But um, for me, I think the way that she is putting a, like a, a distance between her and her son, because I think it's a conscious act. It's not something that happens to her because she doesn't care. To me, it's an act of love because I always felt that she respects his space, like the space of a, of a grown-up human being. And he is grieving, like she is grieving, and she knows. So she knows that her feelings cannot be mingled with his feelings, so she kind of always puts this little air between them. And she, I think she observes him very well. And she's there when it's really needed, but at the same time she knows that he has to do it himself. There is no other way, you cannot help him. And um, yeah, so I found her a very healthy, grown-up mother. That's what I, what I felt when we were playing it. And Milo, Michado Granet is a, is a boy, a, ma a young man now. Um, who has this sort of aura um, that he is very, he's very independent. Mm -hmm. um, when we did the casting, it was obvious that it's not, it would not be a relationship where we would cuddle. It was just impossible to do that with him um, because he is so much himself and he would allow you to do things if he says so, but not like because it's what everybody does, you know. So the relationship between it was somehow formed by him. It wasn't me. I was just reacting to it, to his energy. I do think it was a fierce and incredible portrayal of a great mother. And I think that's one of the things that touched me the most uh, in the film. You know, there is, you know, the scene in the courtroom when the barrister that's representing, uh, prosecuting for Samuel, asks Sandra whether or not she resented him for the accident. And the answer that's written by Justine and Arthur and that you perform just really blew me away. When Sandra says, I never saw Daniel as handicapped. I wanted to protect him from that perception because as soon as you mark a child that way, you condemn him to not see his life as his own. Whereas he should feel that it's his best life because it's the only life he's got. It is his own. And for me, that there was the most beautiful and grounded and real portrayal of motherhood that I've seen in any film this year. It was incredible, and I just absolutely loved it. And she's innocent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, she is, I think. But still, we don't know what happened. And I, I'd love to find out. Justine always says she'd probably say it in 10 years. So I'm waiting. <laughs> OK, um, I'm being told I only have one minute left. And with that one minute, I just want to fan out some more. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just want to say that fight between Samuel and Sandra that comes, you know, we get flashes of it at one moment and we're like, what is that? And it's not until an hour and 27 minutes that we see that fight. And I think the choice to not show the, the physical part of it is so powerful. We didn't even shoot it. We didn't shoot it. We just, the physical part was just a noise part. We didn't, we didn't want to hurt each other. So it was a decision that was there from the beginning. Incredible and just the writing. And so I just have to talk about this writing real quick and just leave that in the room. So Sandra tells Samuel, I refuse to rot inside, so I find solutions. 
which could also be an Easter egg that indicates that she killed him. <laughs> because she's like, I'm not gonna rot inside, so my solution is. And then Samuel tells Sandra, you impose your solutions, which are solutions for you only. You don't give a shit about me and Daniel. Which is the moment that really sets you off the first time. And again, I feel as an indication of your fierce need to protect as a mother. But could also be another Easter egg because you know, the fact that if you did kill him, you left his body outside while for Daniel to discover on a walk back. But I just can't see that happening because I feel like you're a fierce mother. <laughs> anyway, and then Sandra tells Samuel, you made us live here among the goats. You complain about the life you chose. You are not a victim. Your generosity conceals something dirtier and meaner. You're incapable of facing your ambitions and you resent me for it, but I am not the one who put you where you are. You are not sacrificing yourself as you say. You choose to sit on the sidelines because you're afraid, because your pride makes your head explode before it can even come up with a little gem of an idea. And now you wake up and you're 40 and you need someone to blame and you're the one to blame. And I just have to say, I think again, for any person, man or woman, who can relate to being in a relationship with someone, who blames you for their inadequacies and doesn't take the action to take their own life on, that moment I feel was a moment for all of us where I just wanted to throw my computer across the room and scream and shout and just rejoice because you just gave everyone a moment that we all wished we'd have. We, we go away and we think about that speech and we're like, I wish I said that. And it was performed so brilliantly and purely. And by the time you finished, that excellent monologue, I was like, she ain't do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> she gave it to me too, I really have to say. She gave it to me, yeah, so. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.